First of all, thank you so much for tuning in to today's update to the program that we had in March, which was strategic guidance for the business community. It is a bit mind boggling how much has changed in just the short month since we convened together. Our panelists were eager to come together again and share their most up-to-date information and insights with you. So returning to our panel today, we have Dr. Lamar Hasbrook, who's a physician and the former director of the Illinois Department of Public Health, and Jeffrey Korzenik, the managing director and chief investment officer at Fifth Third Bank. And we are thrilled today to be joined by some new colleagues. We have two PwC colleagues. We have Kristen Rivera, who's the global forensics leader, and Shannon Schuyler, who's the chief purpose and inclusion officer. And then moderating today's discussion, we have Dr. Suzette McKinney, who's the CEO of the Illinois Medical District. So following the panelists' high-level summaries of where we're at today and a moderated discussion between the panel, Dr. McKinney will open the floor to participant questions. Before we begin, I just want to take a moment to thank PwC for sponsoring today's webinar for us and their ongoing support of the Executives Club. And with that, I want to turn it over to Dr. McKinney to begin today's program. Over to you, Suzette. Excellent. Great. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you again for joining us today. We are very excited about today's panel. There is much to be discussed. And so for that purpose, I think rather than delay, we will go ahead and jump right in with our first panelist, who is, once again, Dr. Lamar Hasbrook. Dr. Hasbrook is our public health and medical specialist on the panel today. And so, Dr. Hasbrook, we'd like to ask you to just get us started with a current overview of where we are with the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, and let us know your perspective from a health and medical uh, perspective. So, over to you. You're on mute. <laughs> Okay, can you hear there me? You go. Great, okay. So I was saying thank you to Suzette, thank you to Margaret, um, the Executives Club and PwC for sponsoring us again and thank you for all the folks out there uh, watching. So it has been uh, just about a month and I'm gonna entitle my high level comments, what a difference a month can make um, because there are some drastic, drastic differences. So I'm gonna go through go over some of the numbers very quickly and then I'm gonna give you like five or six highlights in terms of the complexion of the pandemic in terms of what's really changed of significance. So let's just start with case count. When we met on March 4th, the uh, global cases were 110,000 and at the time we had about 545 cases in the US. So that has changed. Now it's 1.3 million globally and over 370,000 um, in the U.S. And the U.S. now leads all countries in terms of cases. We weren't even in the top 10 a month ago. Um, in terms of uh, deaths, uh, when we met last, there were just under 4,000 deaths globally. Um, and in the U.S., uh, we had 22 at the time. Today, there's uh, over 75,000 deaths, and the U.S. has more than 11,000 deaths, and we're number three um, in that category now. So just a huge, huge um, uh, escalation in terms of both case counts and in terms of death. The other thing I spent a little bit of time on last time in helping the audience understand the, the severity of this particular virus, um, I went over something called the mortality rate or the case fatality rate. At the time that we met a month ago, that is the percentage of folks who actually die once they contract this this, uh, this illness, this infection. So at the time it was about 3.4% of all persons that um, had, um, had COVID-19 uh, would die. That's gone up to just under 6% now. So that's 5.8%. And, and some of you all who joined us earlier may recall that some of that is an artifact of making sure you get enough testing out there. Um, and I know, I remember Jeff, Jeff, Jeff really kind of really understood this point in terms of the denominator, making sure to get all the testing done so that as your denominator grows, your percentage of deaths um, in comparison to that denominator can kind of shrink as well. So perhaps this is an artifact that we're still not doing enough testing globally and certainly in the U.S. Um, and we'll get into that a little bit. Um, the next category I'd like to talk about is just the actual number of tests. Um, you may recall, some may recall that when we met on March 9th, we had done in our country about 1,900 case uh, tests um, all in. Um, very slow in ramping up. There's been a lot of issues with the testing. I think folks um, understand most of that by now. Um, at the last account, it's been over 
We've done over 220,000 um, tests um, so far. Still woefully low, lower than what we need to, to do. Uh, I recall last time stating that I thought that it was important for us to do at least 50,000 tests a day for every state to really have the ability to do at least 500 to 1,000 tests um, to get the saturation that we really need to, to really understand um, the largeness and the spread uh, of this pandemic here in the United States. Um, we've been testing about five to 10,000 folks a day since mid-March or so. So we're still not up, and, and I'm sure many people have heard that there are still shortages, even for healthcare workers, which are really the top priority to get tested. So those are some of the big numbers. The take home there is that the pandemic here in the U.S. has exploded in terms of cases, in terms of deaths, in terms of fatality rates. Um, and we understand that we're bracing uh, this week and the next week for probably what might be the worst. Um, and there's been recent estimates um, in, ter in terms of the overall severity. So let me just give you, give the audience maybe five or six things that are really important in terms of the complexion of the pandemic. Number one, that is social distancing is still the primary mitigation strategy that we're using. Folks know that there's been a 15, uh, 15 day kind of guidance to slow the spread that's kind of matriculated or changed into another 30 days. So now by the end of uh, April, uh, the government is suggesting um, that folks really try to stay at home. A number of states have embraced that. 43 states so far have a stay at home um, or a you know yeah, stay at home order basically. Um, cover in place, sometimes it's referred to as, but there's still seven states that are holding out. So, um, you know, um, so they're all about, you know, I guess uh, covering, um, you know, in, in, in space because they're still allowing folks to kind of move around uh, versus covering in place. So that's a, that's a, a real important thing to know. Um, there's been some estimates in terms of what the final toll will be, um, and um, conservative estimates are that there may be 100,000 to 200,000 deaths by the time in the U.S. by the time this pandemic um, is over. Um, and again, we had 22 deaths um, at the time when we met last, and we're up to 11,000. So that's a very important change. In terms of the testing saturation, um, we're still inadequate. Um, we still have those high priority groups, which are health care workers, first line, uh, first line workers, um, the elderly, those that have severe, severe symptoms that they can graduate and get a test. Um, but if you don't have symptoms, and we talked about 80% or more being asymptomatic and without symptoms, um, you really don't qualify for a test this, at this time. So rationing tests, everybody can't get a test that wants a test. You really have to be in one of those extreme groups. Um, so we're still behind the curve there. Face masks, there's been some guidance change, uh, recent pivots on the face mask. Uh, you recall that uh, last time we talked briefly about the importance of how a mask doesn't protect you from others, but protects others from you, and how we really suggested and recommended that folks don't go out and get masks because healthcare workers, first responders, um, ambulance drivers, and the like, they need the mask, and there's a shortage, a global shortage of masks. But what's changed as of recent is now there's a recommendation that folks consider wearing cloth coverings, we're not calling them masks, but just cloth coverings, again, to protect your neighbor um, from you. So that's a new wrinkle. And then lastly, there are still uh, severe stockouts on um, PPE, protective, personal protective equipment, as well as on ventilators and other commodities that are needed um, as our healthcare system is really being overwhelmed by this surge in this capacity. Um, and there is a little bit, I would call it a desperation in terms of looking for a quick solution. So um, many of you may have heard of hydroxychloroquine, which is a medication that's used for malaria in um, Sub-Saharan Africa, but it's also used for things like lupus and rheumatoid arthritis. Um, and so there's been an FDA emergency approval to use this kind of on an emergency compassionate use basis. Um, there really is no evidence to support it at this point in time, um, but that's been a recent uh, change. And along with a number of other bogus um, remedies, everything from drinking bleach, uh, to, you know, using silver solution to garlic and, and all the like. So as we are, you know, experiencing more and more severe cases, I think folks are getting either desperate or creative in terms of some of these non-scientific based um, remedies, uh, many of which have been debunked. So those are your high level highlights. And I look forward to getting into a dialogue with, with the audience as we move forward. Suzette, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Hasbrook a very sobering sort of bringing us up to speed in terms of where we are. So before we move to our next panelist, I'd just like to thank Margaret 
for typing into the chat section. Someone wrote in that they want to be where Margaret is. So for those of you that want to put yourselves on a virtual beach, all you have to do is utilize the free Zoom background, which you can find on the bottom left corner of your computer under Choose Virtual Background. So Margaret, thank you for helping us all to get there. With that, we are going to move to our two business experts, and we're going to start with Shannon. Shannon is the Chief Purpose and Inclusion Officer at PwC. So Shannon Schuyler, we will turn it over to you. Thank you. Thanks so much for that. And it's such a pleasure to be here. And as Lamar said, a month certainly makes a difference. And so I think many of us at our organizations were trying to figure out last month at this time how we were going to get everyone to work from home. What was that going to look like? What did that look like for schooling? What did that look like? Um, just to have an appreciation that you weren't going to go in some place every day and how were you going to work through that? And, and I think now we're a month in and people are starting to realize that at least for a duration of time, there is a new normal. And so many things are now coming out of that. And, and you have cities that have now come together to start different types of resiliency funds and really looking for businesses who started out trying to do a bit of everything, trying to get mass, trying to give blood, trying to do everything, trying to consolidate. And so we're seeing a lot more purpose in how people want to approach from a corporate standpoint the crisis and what they can do to stay within their lane and really also work together across industries to make a real impact. We're also seeing that happen at the national level. So the BRT has started to do a lot with really coalescing and bringing companies together, saying if we bring our resources to play in one or two different ways, what are the increased type of impact that we can make? And that's both within PPEs as well as the different types of reporting and really saying how can we start to consolidate where a month ago we were just trying to fight for every single thing that we needed. Now, based upon where we are, what can we do to help? There's been a lot more help, especially from the corporate area of those people who are on the front line. So a real appreciation that this is something that is enduring. And those individuals who are on the front line need so much from hotel rooms to food to garments to be able to just get by. And so I think it's been really interesting to see this movement because there's been very few crises that have happened in the recent future that have lasted so long with a realization that it will continue for a long time. And so I think that's really fundamentally shifted the way organizations are showing the way that they can give back and how that really relates to the skills that they can give. The second thing that we're really seeing is obviously significance on what this means for your employees on various different perspectives. We've obviously seen a lot based upon how the virus is referred to, that there's been a lot of backlash to the Asian community. We're hearing that that is happening throughout many organizations where colleagues in, in different companies are being shunned, um, that they're not permitted to work, even telecommute with other people. We're certainly hearing of that out in many communities, that people are being physically harassed and abused if they're Asian. We're also starting to hear some of that for people who are older, knowing that that's a population too that is more susceptible. And so people are going out of their way to make comments and to steer clear in a very negative way. And so there's a lot that's happening within that type of impression. We also, as you move to being on video, and here we all are in video, and granted, Margaret has the best background, but what's in the background says a lot about you. And so we're hearing and seeing a lot about our people. We're finding out things about who people are living with, about how they keep their home, about how many kids they have. And there's a lot from a diversity perspective that people are taking advantage of. Because suddenly, unwittingly, you've let people into your personal life and your personal space. And in doing so, you're relying on people using that information appropriately, and some people aren't. And, and there's a lot that's coming out of what does that look like. We're also seeing a really big push now as we certainly are not close to the end, but that whole notion around cabin fever and the concern around really people staying calm and staying sane and trying to find outlets. Because what we've seen is many people up until now who really thought this would have only gone on for two or three weeks have not eaten very well, have had a lot to drink, are not working out, have kind of said this will be over, and are now realizing what does that look like in, for longer terms. So you're having a lot of companies start to really push out and roll out programs so that their teams can really start to take care of themselves and realize that this is gonna go on for longer and really determine what that lifestyle will look like and having things, virtual coffee hours, really allowing people the time to step away, even though they're very obviously close to their screens at, at all times. 
We also are seeing for many individuals this whole notion of homeschooling and never being a teacher before. And suddenly having, um, as we were talking about it before, seven-year-olds, five-year-olds, 12-year-olds um, who are asking for things to do because not all schools have the capability to be able to disseminate that information electronically and trying to figure out what does that look like to be somebody who is working from home, who is online, who's trying to homeschool a child with your own content and figure out how that all works together. And you're seeing companies starting to push out a lot of content to actually be able to help employees be able to teach, knowing that there has to be some kind of give with what is actually happening in the household. So there's a lot of things that we're seeing companies start to do very deliberately to one start to put their employees at some kind of understanding that they're not at risk. We're seeing companies making big decisions to um, keep everyone on, to bring interns on so people know and aren't at fear of their jobs. But there's a lot of emotional side to this as well that we're really seeing play out. And I think it really behooves us as organizational leaders that we make sure that that's front and center. Because if our employees don't have the ability and capacity to keep giving what they're giving, then I think even where we are now will continue to get worse. Excellent. Shannon, thank you so much. Thanks, and Lisa. thank you. Now we are going to move to Kristen Rivera. Kristen is also from PwC and she works in the capacity of the global forensics leader. So Kristen, please join us now and give us your perspective from the business end. Sure. Thanks, Dr. McKinney. So um, as part of my role at PwC, I'm responsible for our global crisis center and we help companies prepare respond and emerge stronger from corporate crisis and other disruptive events that have the potential to really negatively impact their business operations or their brand. So we began tracking this virus um, in mid-January, back when there were still less than 500 cases globally. Um, so talking to companies in those uh, that were, had operations in those uh, early impacted areas really helped inform a point of view. And I think I've got a slide here, if, if you guys can put that up. In terms of how companies uh, are responding um, and, and, and how they're impacted by this virus. Because the reality is that um, this is more than, this is first and foremost uh, you know, a health and humanitarian crisis, but that has given rise to a, a sort of a secondary business or economic crisis. Um, and what we found from those early conversations, as well as through our crisis research, is that corporate crisis typically evolves in three waves. And those organizations that are uh, able to successfully accelerate the speed at which they move through these waves are, um, are likely to emerge stronger than their peers. Um, and so this first wave, which really, you know, uh, at least here in the U.S., took place, you know, over the last, you know, four to six weeks, I think, in, in, in many respects, where companies were coming to terms with the fact that this is, in fact, a domestic crisis. Um, and, 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 and very much, you know, th this phase would be characterized by, you know, a feeling of sort of playing whack-a-mole every day where you wake up. And, and there's just an onslaught of, of things that you couldn't possibly have anticipated that need your attention. Securing the safety of your workforce, establishing a structure to respond to what's being thrown at you. Uh, pain points include incomplete and sh you know, shifting information, needing to figure out you know, who your stakeholders are, what information they need from you and when, um, let alone figuring out you know, what you can accurately report to them. Uh, disruptions in your workforce that you know uh, range from absenteeism through to how do you help those who are able to work remotely do that effectively um, which includes you know enabling that technology and making sure they can work securely so we've identified really six major focus areas that really is an inventory that companies can take to think through how they're impacted and what they're doing um, and you see these six areas at the bottom. And really the first two are the ones that we found and, and through um, the work that we've done with companies, you know, has confirmed this, that crisis management and workforce were really the first two uh, response areas that companies tackled in those first few weeks. But what we're seeing now is that um, companies are moving into wave two, which is stabilize. And uh, to, to quote Shannon, at this stage is really about being more purposeful um, and, and putting into place tactical responses 
uh, to address this new normal that we're all operating in. I think, you know, there were companies that, you know, in, in the mobilized phase, and perhaps there are still a few who were hoping this would all be over in a matter of weeks and, and we would go back to normal. Uh, that's clearly not the case. This is something that we will need to operate in for some time to come. And we can't continue to just operate as we did before. Um, and so um, some of the pain points include really looking critically at your workforce and make, taking steps to balance the need to you know, preserve uh, jobs, because clearly that's the best path towards economic recovery with uh, the survival of your business. Um, in the last two weeks, looking at the CARES Act and figuring out what steps you can take to evaluate those programs and decide uh, if that makes sense for your company. And then to think through um, both the application process as well as the process of being compliant with all the strings that that kind of money comes with. Um, performing liquidity analyses and thinking through um, how your business is being impacted from a supply, manufacturing, or operational perspectives, and putting into place measures to uh, stabilize and secure your business through this uh, new normal. And of course, expense controls, limiting spend. Fortunately for all of us, travel uh, expense is, is one area that was uh, taken care of for us. Um, so uh, I think, uh, you know, unfortunately for the travel industry, but for others, that, that's one area that was sort of a natural uh, control. And so focus areas here are very clearly that finance and liquidity, uh, you know, with Q1 coming up, companies are thinking through their financial reporting. Um, also the tax and trade, a number of changes to tax law in the recent weeks, uh, many of which can really help fund some of these other areas. So companies looking at that very carefully now. And of course the operational and supply chain issues. But the last wave is really one that I think we all need to uh, not to lose sight of, and that's strategize. We know from our research that it is possible to emerge stronger. Uh, from crisis and um, and the world will be different. The new normal will give rise to the next normal. The post COVID-19 world will not be the same as the world we lived in before. This concept of remote working we've all talked about. Uh, we expect that this will um, have residual impacts on how we work going forward. And that could have reverberations in terms of where people choose to live, commercial real estate, um, a number of things. People might want homes that have home offices more in the, in the future, having lived in quarantine with their families in small spaces. Um, and so pain points include developing recovery and growth strategies that take into account this, uh, this post-COVID-19 economy, um, deals, acquisitions, divestitures, mergers, um, we expect will, uh, will be prevalent um, responding to changing regulations and dealing with the fallout. Uh, people will be exiting contracts, uh, engaging in new contracts, and there will be claims, there will be disputes stemming from all of that. Um, but all of this gives rise to the opportunity to transform. And what we recommend is you don't wait to start thinking about this. The team that's managing your crisis might not be the best people to begin to think forward. So identify someone who's out of the fray and task them with thinking through how this new future state will impact your company and what steps you can take today to begin to secure that future. Excellent. Thank you so much, Kristen. And now we will move to our final panelist, Jeffrey Korzenik, who is the Managing Director and Chief Investment Strategist at Fifth Third Bank. Jeffrey, so at this point, I'd like to turn it over to you to talk a little bit more about the economic perspective and the economic impacts of COVID-19. Sure. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, and thanks to uh, all the listeners today for, for joining us. Um, I basically wear two hats, economist and market strategist. And usually we can talk from the same uh, outlook. The economy goes down, the markets go down. But obviously, more recently, there's been a divergence. And so I, I want to talk a little bit about uh, where the reality is today of the economy and where we're headed, and then also touch upon that future that we believe the markets are looking forward to. Uh, starting with the economy today, uh, similar to uh, uh, what uh, Dr. Lamar said about uh, some of the, uh, uh, the, the uh, deaths and uh, medical 
uh, situation getting worse over the next couple of weeks. Uh, that's also true of the economy, and in fact, uh, it could linger past that. Uh, we have not seen in the government statistics a huge increase in the unemployment rate, although we've seen a big jump, uh, a historic jump in uh, initial unemployment claims. But we have some interesting surveys that have been done by non-governmental uh, entities that suggest that the unemployment rate today is already north of 15%. And while some of the government mitigations uh, that have been put into place are likely to slow the, uh, the growth of unemployment from here, you simply cannot take an unemployment rate of that magnitude and not expect some structural damage to the U.S. economy. We, we wrote a piece a couple weeks back called Nasty, Brutish, and Short. Uh, the downturn is going to be nasty and brutish, and we still think there's the possibility that it's relatively short. Um, but the path to that will be a, a real challenge. The markets are already uh, looking past the coming bad economic statistics, and they will be bad. But clearly, the performance of the stock market, the S&P 500, up you know, something like 20% over the last uh, couple of weeks, reflects an expectation that it's not unreasonable, that the economy is going to have to, uh, for lack of a better word, reopen in some way, shape, or form. I, I think the... Uh, uh, the optimal medical outcome is going to be different than the optimal societal uh, outcome. Uh, we can't stay locked up forever from an economic perspective. I don't think that there's the political, any political interest in um, entering the Great Depression, which means we have to get restarted. We simply don't know enough yet medically to uh, determine what that path will look like. I, I, I think uh, uh, Lamar, Dr. Hasbrook, you know, could, could not have focused better on the testing issue. Um, we, we really need to do uh, and have in place much more widespread testing before we can articulate the path and the timing uh, of the path to reopening the economy. Uh, one thing that we have noted is that the medical outcomes have generally been better than the models suggest. There's a critical question of why. Is it because we are uh, doing very good at locking down and, and social distancing? Um, if that's the reason we're having better outcomes, then that's a tougher path to reopening because it means we have to we have some severe medical risks if we don't continue that. On the other hand, if it's because we have better treatment or perhaps we have better um, herd immunity, more people have antibody, antibodies than we think, then that's a clearer path to, uh, to opening the economy and getting more robust growth. But we won't know any of this without testing. And we're not yet to the position where we have widespread enough uh, 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 testing facilities in place, the volume, uh, all those facilities that we need uh, to make that determination. I do think it is the time, and this is similar to uh, what uh, uh, both a combination of what uh, Christian was saying and also Shannon was saying, I think we can start talking about the future and what will change. Um, at Fifth Third, one of our beliefs is that one of the biggest changes will be in the relationship between the employer and the employee and employers will take on a much more holistic view of the welfare of their employees. And that has some benefits. We've seen some pioneering firms that we've studied uh, that have already adopted very holistic views of employee welfare. They usually did it because they were hiring workers marginalized from the workforce and that, that uh, uh, those were the, the wraparound services required. And they found, uh, perhaps surprisingly, that these kind of, uh, this kind of holistic view of your employee actually has uh, profitable benefits. Um, in that uh, it not only uh, promotes uh, better performance because you have, you're taking care of the health of your workers, but it also engenders uh, engagement and loyalty towards the employer that pays for itself in terms of high engagement and low turnover. Uh, reducing turnover expense and you have that combination of an engaged worker who stays in place generally drives profitability. So we think uh, this can be one of the very positive outcomes. It's the path to getting through there that we still have many question marks uh, about. Thank you. Jeffrey, thank you so much. And so now we move to the point in today's program where we would like to turn to Q&A and give our audience the opportunity to ask some questions of our panelists. 
So uh, you should have seen the instructions on your screen as well as in the chat feature with regards to how to ask a question. I know we have at least one question in the chat feature and one in the Q&A, but it looks like we are just under 100 participants for today's program. So in order to give some of you the opportunity to formulate your questions, I'm going to start with the first. And I'm going to go to Dr. Hasbrook. So Dr. Hasbrook, you spoke to us about where we are current situation. Um, I think one of the things that is so significant about the COVID-19 pandemic at this point is that we all watched what was happening in China in the very beginning stages. And I'm pretty sure it's safe to say that none of us imagined that the U.S. would find itself in the same predicament as China. But at this point, in terms of case count, and number of deaths, we have surpassed China at this point. So my question to you is, um, how do you think we're doing in terms of our efforts toward flattening the curve? Uh, <laughs> okay, great question. Uh, I'm gonna try to keep it, um, keep it very uh, PC. Um, so uh, let's put it this way, uh, there, there's room for improvement. Um, and I think that a lot of the models really factor in how these other countries have done. Um, South Korea being a success story, mainland China being a success story, Italy and Spain not being a success story. So we're taking that information, we're taking what we're learning here domestically, and we're trying to create some models. But what's important to understand is that although many pundits say we're lagging behind these other countries by four weeks or three weeks or whatever the, the, the estimate might be, um, and so we should peak out and then kind of follow their curve. We can't expect to follow their curve unless we are willing to do what they've done. Um, and some of these countries are very, very aggressive or have been very, very aggressive in locking stuff down. I'm not talking about locking the border down, I'm talking about locking people in place, sheltering in place and staying at home and you know some of the other things that we do kind of electively, you know, voluntarily, it's some guidance to slow the spread. You know, there's a vast difference between guidance to slow the spread and a mandate where uh, you're put in jail if you're found outside, <laughs> you know, um, like in Singapore. Um, so I think that um, where there's a lot of room for improvement, both in crisis communication and getting those messages together. Again, you know, wear a face mask, don't wear a face mask. Just been a lot of kind of misinformation, garbled information, um, and that's kind of hurt um, as well. And, um, you know, as many will say, a little happy talk, too much. Um, and, and still, even today, as we speak, there's seven states that haven't really kind of um, realized the seriousness of the social distancing thing. Um, so, you know, I think we're kind of hurting ourselves in the sense that our response has not been very laser focused, very coordinated and very aggressive. Um, so I think we can expect um, to have a prolonged course uh, of this. Um, the other thing I'll say is that, um, you know, we've talked a lot about the economic piece and ec ec the economy is certainly a driver to reopen business and everybody wants to reopen business to get back to get back to normal. But I think the thing that we're missing is that the short term pain can allow us to do that much sooner. And I think that um, what's been happening is that there's some confusion um, in terms of trying to get back to business, trying to open by Easter or trying to open by whenever, just so we can get that economic engine revving again. But we got it. We got it. We got to sacrifice in the short term to get back there because in the long term it's going to cost us in the end. So that would be my assessment. I'd give us a C. Okay. On a letter okay. grade. <laughs> Thank you. Well, we have lots of questions coming in now. And so uh, what I'm going to do is start once again, uh, Dr. Hasbrook, I'm going to give you another question and then I'm going to move to questions for our business experts. So this question is, you know, can you speak to the difference between traditional testing and antibody testing and how the antibody testing may be used to inform the movement back to work? Sure. So this traditional testing, um, whenever there's a bug, in this case a virus, um, uh, the tests are developed to detect it in the, in the person who may have been infected. So we can detect it two ways. One, by actually measuring for the actual virus itself, 
or the proteins in the virus, pieces of the virus. Um, and that's what this traditional test is really doing. It's, it's swabbing you to see if there's presence or shedding of that actual viral material. Um, and that goes down a pathway that, that becomes developed in a, in a lot of different technical ways we won't get into. So that's one way. The other way is to look at um, um, exposure to it um, by virtue of having antibodies. Because whenever we're exposed to any germ, our immune system creates its defense and antibodies. Um, and then we can measure those actually in the blood. And so that's um, often referred to as a rapid test. So maybe uh, using either saliva or using blood to find out if you have the antibodies in your system, which meant that at some point in time in the past, you must have been infected. Um, and, and usually you're, you're then immune. So that's, that can happen very quickly, that particular test, whereas the other one has to be swabbed, sent to a lab, and typically two to four days you'll get that back, and it's a whole bunch of, it's a much more difficult, complicated process. Um, so the benefit of the rapid test, the antibody test that you're, that you're alluding to, is that you can screen large numbers of people very quickly. And so you can really get a, get a, um, a sense of what is the infection rate out there. We know that 80, 90% of people may be asymptomatic, but who's been infected and therefore who's protected? Um, certainly in the healthcare workers, they're concerned, they have to go home to their family. So by screening them, you can say to them with a rapid test, hey, we've tested you, you're good. Almost everybody here is protected and immune. So therefore you kind of, you can't get it again. And to Jeff's point, you have this kind of herd immunity. That is you're, you're in the body of the presence of a number of people that already are immune to it. So if you get infected, that infection is not gonna travel anywhere because everybody's immune. So you kind of break the chain of transmission there. So those are the differences and those are underway. Those are now being encouraged. Um, a lot of uh, laboratories and universities are starting to work to develop those rapid tests. Excellent, thank you so much. So for our next question, um, I'm going to address this to either Kristen or um, Shannon, but this question is regarding companies and how should companies be addressing layoffs given the uncertain situation? And Jennifer Seitz is posing that question, and she also says there is a risk of just looking at numbers and losing that employer-employee relationship. So I'll let one of the two of you uh, answer that question for us. Chris, I'll start off, and then would love to have you uh, share your expertise. Uh, you know, what we've really looked at, this is about trust, right? We're at a time where we knew going into this, trust was low in business, and for many, trust is low in leadership. And this is something that when you're uh, scared about what's happening, what's happening around you and with your families, that you need to provide some security. And this is about leaders in organizations really being able to show that they're in it with their employees, that they're vulnerable. They too are scared with the things that are happening, but they're working to make it as right as they can based upon the scenarios that they're looking at. We would definitely agree that if you want to take the short-term impact of immediately just letting people go, you don't know how long this is going to last. You don't know what this actually looks like going forward and what that means for that future trust to be built or to be lost as you move down the path. You know, it was really important for our CEO at PwC, Tim Ryan, to be able to go out and say, listen, we are not laying people off. That is a last resort. We are going to fight tooth and nail on every single expense that we have because that's not going to happen. And even so much as our summer interns, and we have about 5,000 of them all kept their offers because we will now be doing a virtual internship, um, as well as our high school students, typically that are diverse in 10th grade, about 700 of them also will have an internship because people are counting on this. They're counting on this to be able to help them financially and to be able to know that they have a career and a place to be. So I think every organization has to look at this and you have to look at your business and you have to make the tough calls and that's why leaders are in those roles. But in doing so, I think it has to be looked at very thoughtfully because there is a lot around an organization that you can take out of the system in order to save costs and you have to make those hard calls as well. And what we've seen is it's a great ability to bring people together. And so if together your leader is saying that we can save the colleague to your right and the colleague to your left, if we look at some ways in order to save what we're doing, not spend on different things, that has allowed people to come together and feel like we truly are this family, this team who together can make a difference. And, and I think what we're seeing is 
there are companies who are slowing down the immediate urge because I think a month ago when this happened, people thought, oh, you could just let people go and it'll be over and then you'll hire them back. I think people are realizing now, how do you actually deploy your resources differently and become more thoughtful and deliberate with that happening? But Kristen, I would welcome your insights from all the companies you've worked with. Yeah, no, I, I fully agree. And so what we're finding sort of tactically is that companies are doing really detailed modeling. Um, again, you know, sort of moving past this knee jerk um, reaction and realizing that to the extent it's possible, um, you know, that layoffs really, you know, that, well, that the, the best path to recovery is to keep people employed um, if we can. And so to try to reserve the drastic measures uh, for, for last resort. And so really doing that detailed modeling to understand what your options are, if there are interim options, perhaps reduced work schedules or voluntary furloughs or, you know, other things that you can employ um, in order to, uh, to minimize the disruption and to ensure that, um, you know, we have a quicker path to uh, getting back on track. Thank you. Jeffrey, I wonder if you might want to weigh in on this question as well. Yeah, thank you, uh, Suzanne. I uh, just wanted to add that we do a lot of work on the demographics of the workforce at Fifth Third. And one of the things that we've been reminding employers is that just two months ago, we were facing a historic shortage of labor in the United mm -hmm. States. And this is driven by demographics. Um, we, we've actually had the benefit of the millennial boom and uh, millennial birth rates peaked in 1990. They're all in. We're hiring now from people born in 1995. Those birth rates were 20% below the millennial peak. Birth rates today are 40% below the millennial peak. This workforce shortage is going to come back. And if you lose workers today, you run the risk of not being able to get them back when the, uh, w when the recovery uh, it takes place. Thank you, Jeffrey. So I want to go back to some of the health-related um, information a bit. So one of the things that we know about pandemics, Dr. Hasbrook, the behavior of pandemics, and we saw this clearly with the 1918 pandemic, and then we also saw the same in 1957 and 1968, that pandemic behavior typically comes in waves. And so considering the possibility that we might see a second or perhaps even a third wave of COVID-19, uh, Jim Kolar, who is participating today, has a question with regards to how do you see the best way to balance return to work and managing the risk of a second pandemic wave? In other words, what needs to be in place, what types of testing and other types of measures need to be in place to get us somewhat back to normal, whatever that's going to mean when this is all over. And a follow on to that is how should employers think about these decisions as someone who will inevitably need to take a bold step? You're muted. Okay, sorry about that. Um, excellent question. I'm glad Jim is joining us. Um, so yeah, I think that first of all, you, you're right in terms of uh, pandemics. Um, and this is a novel, this is a pandemic by, by a novel virus. And so novel means new, new means uncharted, uncharted means, you know, we, we really don't know what's going to happen. Um, what can often happen um, is that it can be a bimodal epi curve or epidemic curve. So it can go up, we haven't peaked yet, come down, and then all of a sudden a quiescent up here, and then it goes up again. Um, and that can happen. We don't know what... The, we don't know if that's going to happen. We have to be cautiously optimistic when we're on the other side of our um, epi curve, when we're kind of on the down slope and cases are slowing and deaths are slowing. I think we can optimistically begin to start opening up business. But there's a couple of signals or triggers that I would suggest um, wearing my hat as a medical epidemiologist in terms of going back to business. Um, one is going to be first start with your own plan. Hopefully businesses have um, prepared a, a um, crisis uh, contingency plan. Um, they have some preparedness plan for some emergency. So what does that plan say? How did that plan, how would that plan guide you? And if you don't, after this, certainly, I think you will be uh, wanting to, to develop one of those. So consult your own plan, uh, first of all. The other thing is the national guidance. You obviously don't want to start opening anything up if there's still a voluntary guidance that says, you know, we need to be doing these very strict social distancing measures to mitigate the risk to flatten the curve and those types of things. So that's kind of another signal um, that you would probably want to look at. 
I would look at case counts. Are those case counts going down in a sustained way, not just kind of a little blip and a blip and then up, but are they really going down in a sustained way? That tells you that we're kind of, we may be moving past at least that first wave. Um, so I think that's important as well. Uh, testing, if testing is broadly available, um, you know, many of us have said this in different ways, the more tests you have, the more you understand the epidemic, the more you understand the hot zones or the epicenters, um, the more you understand the, the, the level of community spread. Um, currently, we're still rationing tests. Um, and so perhaps when we get these rapid tests up and running, in addition to the tests that we have, um, we get some kind of sense of where we're at, that's another signal. So when tests are wide open and folks can actually say, hey doc, you know, I got some symptoms, I really wanna get a test and I'm not in a high risk group, but I'm concerned about it. Um, or hey, uh, Quest Diagnostics, I'm willing to pay for it. You know, then you can kind of, then we'll kind of get a sense of what's going on. So that's another barometer. Um, I'd say lastly, look at your competitors. What are your competitors doing um, in the sector and other sectors? Are they opening up business? Um, think about a phased approach to reopening business. So perhaps, Cautiously, you start with essential workers first, and then some, some select teams second. Um, perhaps think about doing a rotating basis so you can kind of keep the spacing there, maybe some hoteling, so everybody's not in the office at the same time. Um, and then kind of gradually work up to business as usual with um, the addition of a very, more, maybe even more liberal working remote uh, strategy. So again, if you can decompress the density in your offices, you know, so much, uh, so much the better. And then lastly, I would say, look at the business ecosystem. Um, and by that, I mean all of the other things that feed into business. How do people commute? Are ma is mass transportation up? Are bars and restaurants open? Um, are uh, large sporting events and concerts being held? Large uh, national and business meetings? So those are all kind of the triggers and things that I think I would look at if I was a business um, and that I've advised other businesses to kind of think about. Thank you. Those are, those are some critical things that we can all be thinking about, whether you work in the business community or even the healthcare community. So thank you, Dr. Hasbrook. Jeff, You're I'd welcome. like to go, go to you. Um, Vanita Fields has a question with regards to stimulus packages. And her question is, do you think that the government will have to pass another financial stimulus package in the short term? And then I'll add on to that a secondary question what do you think will be the macroeconomic impact of these fiscal and monetary stimulus initiatives? Sure, uh, I, I do think that uh, we will need some follow-up uh, stimulus uh, plans. I think there'll be a short-term one uh, to aid uh, small businesses, and then we'll also see uh, somewhere along the line some longer-term infrastructure uh, uh, spending as well. Uh, the truly remarkable thing about the stimulus uh, packages is, is their magnitude. Um, it's roughly 10% of GDP. Um, if you look at all the stimulus put in place in the Great Depression, uh, it came up to 6 or 7% of GDP. All the stimulus combining into a, a 2008 and 2009, again, 6 or 7% of GDP. So the size and rapidity of uh, injecting this uh, into the economy is truly unprecedented. Uh, and uh, I, I think that will have some long-term benefits. The problem is that uh, a lot of this, uh, like, like every emergency stimulus, uh, there's an inefficiency to it. Um, some of the money will be well spent and some of the money will not be well spent. And the depth of the problem for small businesses is, is really quite severe. Um, what I do think was well done is that the stimulus is in many ways uh, tied to maintaining uh, employment. And so that, that is, uh, and the fact that they've also opened it up to the nonprofit sector is very good. So I think there's some very big positives about this. It's just that given the inefficiencies of putting the money in in this way, shape, and form, it, it, um, uh, it's probably going to need more, particularly if we are not able to uh, go full speed ahead of the economy uh, in, in, the, in the next month or two, which I think probably is, is likely. So there's more coming, and that means that we are um, going to be looking at a greater magnitude impact over the long term. Over the long term, I, I think uh, this suggests that once we do effectively restart the economy, um, the, the, uh, the path to, of growth should be fairly, uh, fairly fast. This is not the 
aftermath of 08, 09, where you had over leveraged balance sheets, you had too much real estate, and you had to slowly work off all those excesses. Here, it was not an economic recession, it's a health recession. If we can get our arms around that, plus add in this enormous stimulus, I think we'll see a very rapid return to, uh, to full employment once we start. And that once we start is, is a, a big question. Longer term, the, the question is uh, what this means, uh, this dramatic expansion of the federal debt, what this means. I think down the road, uh, this will increase the propensity for higher taxes um, at, at the federal level. Uh, probably um, those taxes will fall disproportionately on, uh, on higher earners because that's, that's where the money is, as well as uh, most likely middle class and upper middle class. Uh, at some point, we just have to address uh, a debt escalation of this, of this kind. And I think that's, that's what's down the road. Uh, one of the other elements that I think might be coming in a stimulus that we have to look at, and this is near and dear to uh, those of us in Illinois and Chicago, is uh, what this economic downturn is going to do to uh, state and municipal finances. And it's really going to be pretty ugly. Um, I know Crane's already had a story about potential downgrade or downgrade watch for, uh, uh, for our debt. Um, this is a great concern. Coming into this downturn, I would have said that the prospects for a federal bailout of states and municipal, uh, municipalities was very low because it was really restricted to uh, four states. If you looked at the, the, in particular, at the underfunding of pensions and, and uh, retiree health care liabilities, it was Illinois, of course, New York, New Jersey, and, um, and Kentucky. And I don't think that there was a lot of national will for, uh, for a bailout of uh, states and municipalities. Now, every state and municipality is feeling stress. I think that opens a possibility um, of some kind of federal relief. That would be, uh, particularly for those of us in Illinois and Chicago, that would obviously be something that would be uh, very welcome, but still up in the air. Thank you, Jeffrey. And we've had another follow-on come in, so I'll just ask you now. Um, what industries do you think might emerge from this crisis with long-lasting structural changes, if any? Well, any industry that was split in terms of online delivery of services, and physical delivery of services. So, uh, of course, in, in banking, we've had online uh, channels for our customers. I would expect that more customers than ever use those kinds of, uh, kinds of facilities. Um, we certainly would see that in retail, where uh, online ordering has already been taking, uh, displacing uh, retail stores for a decade or more. That's probably going to uh, accelerate. Um, even healthcare, where telemedicine, uh, people are starting to use these apps for the first time. And of course, what we're doing here today uh, in terms of uh, a teleconference, telecommuting uh, is, is certainly uh, growing. And then I think that those are the first order effects. And then the second order effects are a little less apparent, but I think uh, perhaps even more interesting. Uh, Kristen had mentioned before, maybe this changes the kind of real estate we have, we want and where people live. Um, I think a lot of that will, uh, will be felt in the real estate industry. What that looks like, I think is uh, a little bit, um, uh, uh, it's still a little bit early to tell. Uh, those would be the, the, uh, the top categories and top industries where we think there'll be a, uh, an acceleration to some changes that were perhaps already underway. Excellent. Thank you, Jeffrey. So um, Ashley Fields is participating today. And Ashley, we can see that you raised your hand in the chat. So we are going to unmute your microphone and you can go ahead and ask your question live. So why don't you go ahead and do that now? Ashley, are you on mute perhaps? Okay, so I'm going to assume that perhaps that was a mistake. Um, let's see, it looks like we have a question for Jeff, once again, from Larry Magnuson. And his question is, oh, it's a long one. Many consumer packaged good manufacturers have had, the, have had to change or freeze their new product development plans. What steps can they take now to put themselves in the best position to protect and grow their business once we're on the other side of the pandemic. And Jeff, you know, we'll go to you for that. 
you, you would think a colleague would ask you more of a softball question uh, <laughs> than, than that. And, uh, um, I, you know, I, I think uh, I, I haven't given a lot of thought specifically to manufactured goods, but there is in general uh, going to be, I think, a lasting um, focus on hygiene and, and how, where things are created, how they're packaged. Um, I know there's already been talk in the restaurant industry about how do you deliver food in, in, in sealed packages. Um, so I think that there'll be more of, um, uh, of that going on uh, and that will be kind of a, a first step. In general, in manufacturing, I think there'll be a great desire to uh, continue to reshore manufacturing to the United States. Uh, this uh, has been really in place for the last, nearly the last 10 years. Uh, we've seen manufacturing jobs come back to the United States. There have been certain points of acceleration for that. Um, after 2011, late 2011, we saw a disruption to the global supply chain uh, because of uh, the earthquake and tsunami in, in uh, Japan and, and floods in, in uh, Thailand. We saw a spike in American manufacturing job capture. Um, I think we are likely to see another spike in that, and some of that may be driven, um, uh, may be driven uh, by federal government mandate, you know, protecting our pharmaceutical supply chain uh, and other crucial um, industries. I, I think that's the big, uh, going to be the big trend in, in manufacturing. And that'll have all sorts of other implications for the educational system uh, as well, making sure we have the workers for that. So those are some of the long-term trends. I don't see anything specific to manufactured, uh, to package, uh, uh, package goods other than a trend towards, uh, towards hygiene. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, Dr. Hasbrook, we had a question come in about data and I'm scrolling through and I'm not seeing the exact question at this moment, but from what I remember, the question was the, the, the participant indicated that uh, some discomfort or distrust with some of the data. What, do you, what are your thoughts about the data that we're seeing in terms of number of deaths considering the slow rate of testing that we're seeing in many areas, particularly here in Illinois? Um, so I would say that, yes, the data is critically important in how we navigate through this pandemic. Um, it's probably only as good as the science behind the way it's collected. Um, and, and, and even the models is only good, are only good as the assumptions that go into the models. Um, I really have no reason to suspect um, misinformation in terms of the data, but I would say I'd have a healthy suspicion of um, not believing that there's a real data lag. So in other words, everything we're seeing is probably lagging behind by about a week. So we're seeing, in, in other words, we're, we're behind on the data. So today's data is not as high as it should be. Um, when we catch up, when the testing and catch up of the processing, because remember, even when you do a test, it may take you know two or four days to even get that that test um, done. So I think that this should be a data-driven response. Um, I would tend to um, believe the data at this point in time. I think that um, if we have more tests and they're more um, readily available, certainly when we get into a rapid test, and we can do what's called serial serial uh, surveillance, as you know, um, Sentinel surveillance, kind of really get a sense of how many people in a given community actually have, have this condition or infected. Um, the better the data gets, the better the decision should be um, in terms of the data. The last thing I will say is that it's very important to let the data um, and the science kind of lead the policy. I think sometimes what I've seen, which has been a little troubling to me, is sometimes there's some policy that's out there and then there's some kind of rejiggering of the data to help support that policy. And that really isn't the way, um, that, that really isn't the best way forward um, in, terms of, um, in terms of using data. The data should really determine how we mitigate this. Um, and if it's gonna change opening up, reopening businesses, if it's gonna change um, the mitigation strategies, relaxing the social distancing, all of that really should be dependent on the data. If we see that the problem's getting worse, it's getting super saturated. We, we know that in New York City, for instance, maybe 30, 35% of the folks who are tested are actually positive. You go to California, Washington, it may be 10, 15%. So th those things make a real difference. New York City, not ready to open, 
Okay, somewhere else, right. Utah, <laughs> they might be ready to open. So that's kind of that's that's the importance of the data. And so um, the the person's question is is spot on in terms of you gotta be able to trust the data because it's so pivotal to how we respond. Thank you. And I did find, and I, I want to make sure I recognize Dwayne Celestan for asking that question. But a perfect follow-on question to that, Dr. Hasbrook, comes to us from Mike Tamalo. And his question is, why haven't we done random testing for a population parameter? Wouldn't this give us an estimate of total cases by region so that we can make better estimates with regards to true mortality rates? Right, so uh, great question. I think that would be the gold standard. Um, the gold standard would be, you know, everybody, you know, um, everybody is offered a test or certainly you randomize and you then you take those estimates and you uh, you extrapolate to the entire population and do that. Uh, a couple reasons. One is because we have a test shortage and we can't afford to just be randomizing folks because what about the elderly person that has two health chronic health conditions and they need a test? but you spent that on a random healthy person that's asymptomatic and now we don't have the test. So rationing is, is yeah. answer number one. Uh, number two is it's probably smarter to do something like serial, serial surveillance that I described earlier um, a second ago in terms of getting you know, population estimates um, and the like. And then lastly, again, it's about how to use the information. So if we did a random, you know, random testing, assume, assuming we had plenty of tests for everyone, and we can randomize everybody and get some sense. Um, how is that information going to be, how is that gonna guide our mitigation strategies, our response strategies differently than what we have today? I think we'd still want to make sure social distancing is here. We'd still wanna make sure that folks understand, you know, um, that um, it, it does, we, we do have to employ these mitigation strategies. So oftentimes when you're um, a physician or medical provider, the question, that leads, uh, the question that you have to ask in terms of doing any test is, would the test results change my recommendation or my behavior in any way? If the answer is no, don't do the test, it's a waste of money, and sometimes we find incidental findings that now we have to act on and do another test, another test, another test. Um, but if it will change what we do, then it's probably a good thing to consider. In this case, we're rationing. Perfect. Thank you so much. So Shannon, I wonder if you, so first of all, let me just state, you know, Dr. Hasbrook has spoken about challenges with regards to testing. We also know that there has been a significant number of challenges with regards to obtaining personal protective equipment and other supplies that are needed for the response. And so I think what that helps us all to understand is that the nation as a whole is just going through an incredibly difficult time. Can you share with our listeners from your perspective how the business community might be able to help our government partners with regards to some of these challenges? Thanks for that question, and I think it's a couple fold. I think one, we're seeing organizations at the corporate level say, what are the skills and what are the distribution channels that we have? And what are our products that we can actually put to work? And so how do we actually reach out as the BRT and others have done and bring together our assets to be able to share those because we can continue and corporates are writing checks, which is great, but also what we're seeing is government and others are asking for our help and helping them to look at the data, to look at the supply chain, to look at what's happening next and to really be able to leverage that. We're actually seeing a lot of companies now really work across different groups to say what's needed. And so in the education space, you've had different cities as well as um, governors that have come to different companies saying, if you have the hardware and you have the internet devices and you have the content, how do we put those things together in order to be able to deliver a product through our schools? And so really looking to say what's needed and to be able to get within that collection of organizations that can solve it. I think the one good thing that we're seeing is there's very few organizations who are saying, I'm going to solve this on my own, which I'm glad about because they're not going to be able to, but says, what is the piece of the puzzle that I can solve for? And how do I really make sure I'm doing that at scale and that I can bring others in to do? Simultaneously, one of the things that we're seeing is really important for the humanity of this is to allow your people to give back in ways that are most meaningful to them. Because what we're finding is that everyone who's now at home and you're at home within your local community. So there's one thing an organization can do nationally 
But then at PwC, you have 90 different offices. And so you have everyone who can actually see within their own backyards things that are happening and things that are most in need, whether that's blood, whether that's getting to people on the front lines with food, people can see what's happening. And so really permitting an outlet and giving your people both suggestions as well as allowing them to talk about the things mm -hmm. that they're doing with themselves, with one another, with their families, to be able to really get that collection of things. And what we found is that for really that mental and moving people past just survival mode to really being able to thrive, it's being able to thrive at work, but to also feel like you have meaning and purpose in the things that you do. So we're seeing a lot of companies really offered this tiered approach of this is what we can do at scale and frankly how we can do it with others but then also really encouraging individuals to do what makes the most sense for them and to be able to share it and celebrate it so you're getting that humanity coupled with really being able to problem solve in those significant issues from hospital systems to governments thank you shannon and i know that uh, pwc has a COVID-19 navigator that they have launched for assistance to businesses. So Kristen, would you like to add a little bit about the navigator? Sure. So, um, you know, in the early days when, when companies were really in that mobilized phase, trying to make sense of this, we made a decision to tap into the, um, the, the thinking of more than 20 subject matter specialists across PwC and to take the, the, their thinking about both how companies could be impacted uh, in those six areas I mentioned earlier and also how you know they're responding and to make that available for free on our website so that companies could get real-time information to help shape their um, their response to this in those early days. Um, we now have more than 2,000 responses from around the globe. We've uh, globalized that into six languages and um, and so in the next week, we'll be adding benchmarking so you can actually look at your responses and how you're doing relative to similarly situated companies. Um, so that's still something you know, that we recommend um, that you do. It's, it's good, especially now that we're a few weeks into this, to take stock of, of where you're at and to get ideas um, of additional steps you could take. Um, and that can be found on our website or if you just Google um, PwC COVID-19 Navigator, um, you, can, you can find that. It takes about a half hour and we recommend that you um, maybe get together with some of the executives in your company because, you know, it might require some insight in terms of how you're responding from an HR perspective, from a finance, from a tax. Um, so it's a good thing to do it as a team, um, but it can give you some, some useful insights um, that can help uh, drive your response. Thank you, Kristen. That is a fantastic resource for our business partners. So I just want to do a quick time check. We are about 20 minutes remaining in our program. So before I go to the next question, I'd just like to first and foremost, thank all of the participants for such wonderful questions that you are submitting today. I'd like to call your attention to the note that you may have seen in your chat box that just in case we run out of time and you are not able to get your questions answered, you can still email your questions in to programs, that is plural with an S on the end, at executivesclub.org, and we will get you connected with the panelists most appropriate to answer that question. So, Kristen, I wanna go back to you for a moment because I have two questions that I think uh, would be great for you to address. So the first, is what expectations should managers have for their employees in terms of workload, checking in, and other associated activity while folks are working remotely from home? And then the follow-on question is a little bit more complicated, I'd say. Considering the estimated 15% unemployment rate, what other insight might you have regarding hiring trends, layoffs, hiring freezes or other types of actions that we might see um, as a result of this crisis? Sure, so, so first on the workload question, um, and, and Shannon touched on a bit of this too, I mean, this really are unprecedented times. We have, you know, including some of our panelists, you know, have young children at home. They're not only working, uh, but now learning how to homeschool and, um, uh, helping take care of pets and all sorts of other things. Um, but also the workday is just expanding, right? Um, you're not uh, finding yourself getting up and commuting in as you often might. Um, 
And then there's silver linings. Uh, you know, I, for one, am someone who traditionally travels quite a bit. And um, so the, the being able to be home and, uh, and not have to spend that time um, getting in the car or getting on airplanes has actually created additional bandwidth for me personally. Um, but what, you know, so a number of things we have, you know, colleagues who have recommended, you know, taking a walk in the time that you would ordinarily commute. Um, still having a time to end your day, um, even though, you know, you're just steps away, perhaps, um, uh, you know, putting some structure into place. And I think for many people, this didn't happen in the first few weeks. Um, but now that we're realizing this might go on for some time, I think people, again, you know, moving from mobilized to stabilized are beginning to stabilize their personal lives as well. Um, and, you know, this is also a time to, uh, to enjoy, you know, your family and, and your home. And, and so not forgetting to take some time to, you know, take on some of those projects um, or, you know, to, to do something with, with, um, with your family that maybe you don't otherwise have time for. Um, you know, I'm looking at potentially six months of my children not being in school. And, you know, I think looking back at this, if I don't take advantage of that and in some way I'll regret it and so I think you know these are unusual times and the more that we can share those stories and help um, our workforce think of you know ways to not just survive but to thrive in this unusual time is something that you know is important for all of us to do. Also recognizing we have you know some of our, our less tenured workers um, or our city workers might be living in really small space um, or living with perhaps three, four, five roommates. Um, and there's a great deal of stress. Others who live alone might be um, experiencing depression. Um, those that are separated from their families. I have someone on my team who's just recently come here from Australia to do a short-term secondment, and now she's here in the US apart from family and friends. So, um, you know, I think we really need to be kind to each other and think through all of those implications on our on our teams and help take care of each other um, in these unusual times. Thank you, um, Kristen. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Did you have more to add? No, I don't know, Shannon. If you have any, any other thoughts on that particular topic, but no, I I think that that you covered everything. I I think you know this is one of those amazing things that typically people don't have multiple work offices at home, and so they don't have this nice compartmentalized space for um, themselves, other people to go in and to actually work. And so typically, what we find is people have either they're trying to stake out the kitchen, I have the bedroom, and you know, and there we shall meet, and everyone will walk through to get to the bathroom, right? So it's it's one of those that. Is constantly happening and, and I think the one good thing that will come from this is people are having and forced to be more understanding of what happens in someone's personal life because it's happening in front of many people to be able to see and so to have that appreciation I think will go a long way for people to have that genuine authenticity of caring about individuals as individuals because we've been forced into seeing the situation and, and to be able to deal with it and to be able to cope with it um, but I also think it's a time where we're seeing more so than ever you see people break down right I mean this is tough and at the end of the day if you've been up, as Kristen said, you, you missed your commute where maybe you spent that 30 minutes on the train by yourself kind of regrouping from what happened at the dinner and everything the night before, you don't have that now. And so you're on 24 seven. And I think we're making sure that people have to leave their desk, even if their desk is in the kitchen, they're going to have to find a way not to be there any longer and to find some personal time to be able to be down and to reflect. And I think we as leaders have to encourage people to schedule that time, just as they're scheduling all of these calls. Because getting through this mentally is something that we've seen as one of the biggest strains that people are having and making sure that we're compassionate to that is just so vitally important for the health of our business to be able to go forward. Thank you, Shannon. Um, this next question I think is really interesting, or at least I'm going to take an interesting approach to it, and I'm going to ask both Jeff and Dr. Hasbrook to tag team this question, if you will. Um, so the question is, how do you see hospitals financially affected? Um, we're seeing many layoffs and closures happening even during this COVID-19 pandemic, and large financial losses are occurring, and so what do you think about how hospitals and healthcare systems will be able to recover? You know, we know that there's an extreme impact on the front line 
hospital staff, but what about their economic uh, situation moving forward? Uh, you know, I never thought I'd spend so much time intertwined on medical and healthcare issues uh, in my role. And uh, I think uh, Dr. Hasbro probably never thought he'd be into so many economic issues. Um, you know, the hospital industry is obviously being taxed on this. I, I think there'll need to be uh, some kind of government support uh, for this, at least for this um, intermittent, at least for the period covering the pandemic. This is particularly true of, of rural hospitals, which have already been under enormous stress. And, uh, you know, this is this is kind of a breaking point for, for some of these. So I, I, I don't see um, any path that doesn't have some kind of support uh, for the extraordinary burdens that are being put on the, on these facilities. Dr. Hasbrook? Uh, yes. Um, so the $2 trillion is going to help. <laughs> I think there's $150 billion uh, earmarked for uh, health and hospital systems, uh, the, you know, public health system uh, and some of those. So that certainly is going to help. Again, you know, everybody has their hands tied and full in terms of dealing with the surge right now. So they'll have to, you know, smartly figure out what they need to do to access that money to try to try to become whole. Um, so I think it's going to be very challenging. You know, I've spoken with some of my colleagues who uh, maybe they had, they work in kind of an outpatient facility, um, more of an elective dermatology, some of the other specialists, and, you know, their patient census is going right down. Um, they're there, they're reporting for work, but nobody's coming in because, you know, they're taking this thing uh, serious. So there's a lot of repercussions that I think we don't quite understand the magnitude of right now. There's also the, the piece, uh, the expense related to not only and when we think of preparedness, we think of, you know, the, the preparation and then the response and then the recovery. There's going to be a lot of costs in the recovery phase. Um, how do you de-escalate, you know, having an extra 500 ventilators in your, in your space? <laughs> you know, how do you de-escalate, you know, some of the other stuff that you've had to do, deal with in terms of storage of commodities and supplies and things like that? So there's a lot of costs. Um, we haven't been here before to this magnitude, so I think we'll all be learning together, but... Uh, the question is very important, um, and I think that what's what's important for our government to, to continue to think about is that it doesn't end when the epi curve slows down and we're kind of the worst is behind us. There's a whole bunch of work and expense to rev things up and get those employees back um, who may, you know, think about shifting uh, to another career, actually, after this kind of burnout that happens. We know that, you know, the AMA data shows that, you know, physicians are burnt out to begin with. About 60, 70 percent of them are burnt out. Um, from all the hours they do and then the work after work and the charting and all the other things. This is extreme. This is burnout on steroids. So there's going to be a lot of repercussions um, and a lot that needs to be done to, to make the health and hospital systems um, whole. Thank you. It's a really interesting point that you make about burnout. Um, it actually feeds perfectly into the next question, which I was going to pose to Shannon. Um, Shannon, I'm wondering if you can speak to the various ways that we can all be helping ourselves and our team members, our staff, with issues surrounding their mental health um, during this difficult time. You know, mm. so many of us are struggling for various reasons. So how can leaders within businesses help their teammates and their staff members deal with issues around mental health? Well, a lot of what we're talking about is staying connected to people. So the one thing that's nice when you have an office and you go in, if someone's not having a good day, usually you can tell they're not having a good day. And someone will approach them and will ask them what's wrong or something that's going on. Now, if somebody doesn't want to join the webcast and somebody doesn't want to be there, they could go days without having an interaction, especially people who are at home and are living alone. So one of the things that we're finding is really pushing that interaction. So one, having standard interactions that the whole organization can focus on, whether it's virtual town halls or webcasts. So they're hearing from people and they're hearing different things that people are going through and realizing they're not the only one that is going through different things. So people become more open to share their stories, especially leaders saying this was really tough. I'm trying to juggle all these things. But then their direct supervisors really working to have either one on one or group chats setting up just this is no work but let's get together for coffee before work starts and let's just talk about what we're doing or doing at the end of the day obviously right now virtual happy hours are becoming a thing to do we're also having a lot of people who are doing virtual workouts and walking together and doing things i think it's really important that we make sure we don't lose actual sight of people 
because that is going to give us a better idea of how people are doing emotionally. Uh, there's also a lot of different apps that we're sharing with our people, whether it's the Calm app, whether it's different resources for them to contact if they're suffering from different mental health issues and really need somebody to talk to. Um, but I think the most important thing is everyone is so busy with their work and their lives that I worry that people will get left behind. Mm -hmm. And it's really easy to not check in and to not check in visibly if you're really trying to stay behind um, the camera to not be seen. And I think really having supervisors as well as the organizations make that a priority of how do you set that time to be able to go face to face and really see what's happening. Because I do believe that we're going to see some significant mental health challenges continue to come out of this. So for those individuals who already suffered from anxiety and other issues, this is making it worse. And this is also making it worse for people who you never knew we're suffering from different depression and other things. And so I think it behooves us all to take that time to keep physical eyes on each other and take care of one another. Thank you, Shannon. I really appreciate that. So before we move toward our wrap up, I think what I'd like to do, there's a member of the Executives Club who has um, been on the webinar today, Rebecca Reed has been submitting some fantastic questions. So Rebecca, I think you have one additional question that we did not answer. So I'm going to ask the, um, the team there to unmute your microphone and give you the opportunity to ask your question live. Yeah, can you hear me? Rebecca Reed. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, go right ahead. All right, perfect. Sorry, I've asked so many questions. I'm trying to go back and see exactly what I wrote. Well, I saw you had one about brands that we didn't answer yeah, yet. Yeah, yeah, no, that's perfect. So, you know, we've all been seeing a lot of leaders come out and certain companies, certain brands who I think are doing better than most. And I just wanted to hear from you guys, from some experts on maybe certain clients or certain brands that you think have handled this really, really well. And then maybe some that have really missed the mark on their communications with whether their employees, their clients, or their vendors kind of over the past couple of weeks. Go ahead, Dr. Hasbrook. Okay. Thank you. I have a success story, so I'll, I'll, I'll leave the doom and gloom for others. Um, uh, so there's one company um, that uh, specializes in kind of web-based um, uh, tools for health behaviors. Um, and one of the tools that they have in their suite is really around stress and resiliency. And obviously, we're all under stress, and we all need to improve our resiliency as we're making these shifts. So one of the things that they did, which I thought was very, very effective, is they said, well, look, listen, we have this, we're working with large, you know, wellness employers, wellness companies, corporate wellness companies and things. And, and um, some of them use these things, some of them don't. Why don't we promote this um, in a way that we're giving it away to folks? So we're saying, look, so we, we can increase our brand or corporate social responsibility by taking something we already have that's so well needed that can be delivered at the right time, in the right place, at your home, in the right way, on your device or whatever, and let's let's get that out there, um, not only to our existing customers, but to those who might want to share it with their um, covered lives or customers or whatever the case may be. So I thought that was brilliant. There probably will be some marketing bounce out of it, but I think more important than that, um, to the case we've been talking about, is just being a good corporate citizen and saying, hey, I have something to offer, and I'm going to offer this for free. So I think that's a great example. Thank you. Let's see. Kristen or Jeff? I'll, I'll jump in. You know, I've noticed a number of firms, and, and Fifth Third is one of them, that have um, stepped up and uh, given bonuses to frontline employees. I think that's a good look um, and uh, really shows uh, which companies are putting their money where their mouth is. Um, uh, those who are in the position to hire, again, I'm more aware of this because Fifth Third just announced we're hiring a thousand new customer service people in a, in a time of high unemployment. Um, that's obviously uh, welcome news and, and, and sends a signal. Many large firms have also um, uh, frozen their employment and announced early to their employee base, I think Visa was one of them, that they wouldn't have any, um, uh, any layoffs during the period. I mean, think, think what a signal that sends uh, to the employees who are obviously in one sense brand ambassadors uh, for their companies as well. And then on, on the flip side, um, I saw that um, General Motors um, 
sparked, you know, rightly or wrongly, the president invoking the Defense Procurement Act um, to get ventilators built. I thought that was a uh, a real brand failure from a uh, from a major uh, from a major company. Thank you, Jeff. Um, Kristen, go ahead. Yeah. Our, just speaking generally, our research on crisis, you know, definitely proves that brand and crisis response are tied together. And in fact, uh, in today's world, the public expects that you are able to respond effectively to crisis. What's interesting about this is this is not a company specific crisis. This is global and it is impacting everyone. So to some degree, the playing field is level. So what you know, we'll see is winners and losers, right? Those who uh, succeed particularly well in uh, staying true to their purpose and their values in this crisis and ultimately reinforce their brand and gain strength. And then we will see, and we're beginning to see, you know, some signs of this companies that, um, that don't, right? That, um, that lose their way in this crisis, either because they don't stay true to their brand and their values um, and, and, you know, their purpose overall, and they uh, stray, um, or because, you know, they make knee jerk, um, you know, uh, decisions um, that backfire on them. And so, um, you know, this just really reinforces how important it is to have a crisis management strategy um, that aligns with your purpose and your values and that you're going back to those core principles as you make decisions throughout, not just in those early days, but all of the decisions that you make. Um, now is not the time. And we've, you know, through our research, um, have demonstrated that there's a number of things that companies that ultimately emerge stronger from crisis do that other companies don't do. Um, and one of those, you know, uh, the data, you know, demonstrates is, is, is staying true to your values. Thank you. Well, this has certainly been quite an informative and engaging discussion today. Um, we are about three minutes out from our end time. So I first want to take a moment to thank all of our panelists this afternoon. Dr. Lamar Hasbrook, Shannon Schuyler, Kristen Rivera, and Jeffrey Korzenich. Um, I think the information that you've all provided from your background and expertise has been phenomenal for our audience this afternoon. Um, it's certainly been my pleasure to have the opportunity to moderate this panel, and I want to thank the Executives Club for having me today. And I think what we'd like to do is, in our last two minutes, Turn it back over to Margaret Mueller, the president of the Executives Club for our wrap up. Margaret, over to you. Thank you, can you all hear me? Yes. Okay, great. So thank you so much, Lamar, Jeffrey, Kristen, Shannon, Suzette, for spending this lunchtime with us. Your insights are so timely, so appreciated by our members and the business community at large during this time where everything feels so uncertain. I think you all just give us a sense of um, calm, you know, and assurance and the guidance that you're giving is so appreciated. I think we're probably gonna ask you back for a third wave if you're up for it because things are changing so quickly. Um, I think we should continue to have these conversations. Thank you to PwC for sponsoring our webinar today. And now more than ever at the club, we are relying on virtual content. I think you're seeing a lot of virtual stuff coming out from us. You know, the first program we did on this, it was partially in person, part virtual, and we had a lot more virtual than in person. Now it's all virtual. It'll be interesting to see how things go. And so we're trying to engage everyone as best as possible. So just a few initiatives that we wanna be sure all our members are aware of. So first, um, we have created a LinkedIn membership group for people to continue to connect and share online outside of the normally in-person things that we do. So you should have received an invitation from Leslie McDavid to join our LinkedIn group. If not, please check your spam and we're also gonna put the link in the chat. So please do that because we're sharing a lot there. We also have a resource page on our website um, that we are continually updating with information and resources shared by our board of directors and members. And we do have the PWC link on there. So go to our website. We have tremendous business and community resources there. And finally, I wanna remind you of our Coffee and Connect programs that we've started. So these are at 8 a.m. Um, they're morning coffee chats. Some weeks we do two, three, four, and so we have two more scheduled this week, tomorrow, 8 a.m. It's what do I need to know about adapting my marketing and communication strategies with Melissa Harris, who's the founder and CEO of Melissa Harris and Company. And on Friday, 
we have um, what's a mouthful, but what I need to know about relocation, tax concerns, telecommuting, compensation, the CARES Act, employee retention, deferrals, credits, hardship assistance, and more. We have a bunch of tax experts from KPMG who will cover off on those topics. So please join us if we can. And if you have topics that you would like us to cover, please let us know. We have lots of members saying, you know, could you please do a Coffee Connect on this? Here's something I need more information on. So let us know and we'll pull one of those together. And so if you didn't get your question answered, I think we just had two left. You did such a good job getting through all these, Suzette. Just email us. We will get you to the panelists. If something comes up, you know, later on in the day, and you say, oh, I wish I would have asked this. Just let us know. We'll, we'll get you connected with the people who can answer it. So thank you all again. Be well, everybody. Thank you for joining us and we'll see you again soon.